Welcome, I'm Brad Perry, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Grain Produce SA. Uh, today we're going to be digging below the surface uh, into the soils, particularly soils on the York Peninsula. So why are we doing this? Well, we know that sustainability underpins everything we do as a grain industry. With that in mind, uh, GPSA received a grant from the Northern and Lo Northern New York Landscape Board through the Grassroots Grants Program. The shifting climate poses several hurdles for farmers and landholders, demanding adaptation, impact reduction, and enhanced resilience in both farming practices and business strategies. We hope this webinar will support grain producers and mixed farmers in the Northern and York region by equipping them with essential skills in soil data management, mapping, and interpretation. Soil health assessment will be a key focus of today's webinar, as will soil moisture level analysis and strategies for minimizing greenhouse gas emissions. We've got a full agenda today, starting shortly with Michael Ayres from Field Systems, who will take us on a virtual crop walk and soil pit dig at Anthony and Shelley Litster's property uh, at Karamolka on the York Peninsula. We'll then hear from research agronomist Sean Mason from Agronomy Solutions, who's going to give us a rundown on soil mapping techniques before he summarizes some Saget funded research uh, looking at the benefits of on-row sowing on the York Peninsula. Brian Hughes as well from Persa will then take us through considerations for soil health, followed by Ollie Madgett from Farm Lab, who will take us through some soil sampling and testing and, and some of his experience in that field. So we've got a jam-packed agenda. Uh, we'll save all our questions until the final session. If you do have a question during each present presentation, please make sure you pop it in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, when you think of it, we'll collect all the questions and put them to the speakers later on. You won't have the opportunity to turn your mic on and ask questions live, so please make sure you use the Q&A box, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And a reminder that we're after questions we can all learn from, um, and any statements will certainly uh, try and turn into questions. We're now going to hear from Michael Ayres, who's going to take us on a, on a virtual crop walk at Soil Pit Dig at Anthony and Shelley Litster's Karamolka Farm on the York Peninsula. Hi, I'm Michael Ayres from Field Systems. Uh, welcome to this virtual crop walk hosted by Grain Producers SA and very generously funded by the Northern York's Landscape Board. So today we're going to look at the soils on Anthony and Chelly Litster's property at Karamolka on the or central part of the York Peninsula. Uh, I visited Anthony earlier this month and we had a chat about his farming system, his soils, how he looks at his landscape, how he understands it and then the decisions he makes and actually has made in the past to suit a path forward in terms of production and profitability from those soils. So it's very much a general dialogue on how yeah, he understands his landscape. Because from my perspective, someone coming in uh, that hasn't farmed that landscape, it can be quite dangerous if you're not actually part of that landscape like the farmer is. It doesn't matter how technical you are, how good you are in soils and plants and whatever, or as an agronomist, advisor, soil scientist, or whatever you are. Um, yeah, the farmer knows far more than he thinks he does. And I think that needs to be highlighted. Yes, there'll be a language difference between how everyone describes things, certainly in relation to soils. And we need to match that up over time. Like, and it's starting to happen as farmers with expensive land are now looking to get far more production from their own farms, knowing they can't, can't quite, probably can't financially expand at the pace they'd like to. So. They want to expand within the land system they own. So that now governs different soil management decisions. And I think that's part of what we're discussing with uh, Anthony today. Uh, Anthony grows wheat, lentils and canola. The canola hadn't come off yet, so hopefully that makes it through the rain or has made it through the rain that's just been through. Uh, he's been operating under a strip and disc system for the past three years, which he adopted to obviously conserve moisture and grow more competitive uh, crops to help him tackle problem weeds such as obviously annual ryegrass and uh, biophora. So, and also, yeah, using a John Deere disc seeder on 190 mil spacings with narrow rows, again, used as part of his 
integrated weed management strategy or an integrated weed management strategy. They're always changing. He's also on controlled traffic farming uh, with a machinery width in multiples of 12 metres. So yeah, he's very organised system, uh, very well managed system. So the discussion was just about really how he engages with his landscape and how he understands it. Spread variable, right? Previously, I've only done in three. You got three zones. Yeah. see much of that on that lighter country or is it not? Uh, where we used green? to live, which was south of well, down near Stansbury on the uh, sand over clay, we'd always see the deficiency there. Yeah. Um, but not so not much here on this coast. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, that country was when we introduced our liquid system on the previous cedar. Yeah. Because it was probably important there. Yeah, we didn't get a chance to, as we would have liked, it just didn't work out to get a fully functional sort of four metre long pit with an exposed face of a metre and a half. But we looked at the sidewalls, if you like, on a roadside to look at, for us, just look at what soils are there and how they would operate in a farming sense. So we didn't actually get a chance to dig in paddock. We walked in paddocks with Anthony, but so we looked at the roadside and I know over time there would be a bit of wind uh, and water erosion and different things and graders moving soil around. So we picked a couple of areas that we thought had been largely not too badly interfered with, just visually to give people an understanding of the soils that we're dealing with. And critically, in all parts of a farm, on all parts of a farm, soil can change slightly everywhere. But as humans do and we do in agriculture, you need to classify them into certain soil types or soil performance zones. And most farmers would run on three or four, depends where they are in Australia. But I'd say here, in this instance at Karamulka at Anthony's, he's running probably three, not running, but there they, they exist three different soil types uh, or large general changes in soil type. So it's always good to go and fossick around and have a look and just see if the soils are, whether they're dispersive or how much rubble and rock is in the soil, the surface soil, how deep that is, uh, whether you're running subsoil sodicity, you may have high boron and there's sort of analysis that you'd need to do with a lab to quantify that. but. There are things you can do quickly in field to work out just by measuring pH, like very generally, but if your pH goes up above, say, eight and a half, you know that the carbonate 
or reaction of pH in that's probably formed by sodium carbonate, not calcium carbonate. So there's, I know you've got lab analysis to sort of quantify it, but for us it's always just having a look around. But the most critical thing you can do is speak to the farmer and ask them about how they understand the landscape. Because if you get a farmer to do a map in his head and he's farmed that land for years, it's more accurate than anything you can use. And then you can use all of the biomass imagery and the EM mapping and whatever you wanted to do in gamma radiometrics and everything or chlorophyll mapping or whatever from satellite, moisture mapping from satellite. And largely it all does gradually filter back to what, or the zoning does to what the farmer has written in texture from his original map. Looking here, you can see that's more of your red clay. There's a little, that's your beautiful red soil. In these areas, that's your red loams, that's beautiful. And you can see your surface rock which largely has been collected from a lot of this country from the top of it and put into piles along fences. But that's not your grey, that's your beautiful red loam from here. Over, if you go a little bit deeper down here, you'll find that calcareous material. That depth, again, under there. But beautiful, friable topsoil with lumps of calcrete in it and carbonate rock you can see all the roots going down through it but that's look at that magnificent patch of dirt you can see the roots down to depth and dry under here but you can see the moisture from there up Mind you, we've had an inch of rain. So, it would have gone in last night. But that's why that land's worth so much. So here on this face, we're just applying to a very simple uh, kit you can get in Bunnings or wherever. Um, a pH kit, so it's got a, a, a purple indicator solution and then a powdered or barium sulfate powder in there. So it just gives you a guide of what the pH is when you test it in the lab in water. There, there, so alkaline, probably, probably running at about eight pH in there. So no, probably running at about eight pH in there. So and a half to eight pH. That's uniform pH, isn't it? I'd say if it cropped, it'd be probably quite different near surface because there's been more removal and more capacity to generate a drop in pH. But that's naturally how these soils are. That beautiful clay loam. This calcrete. This carbonate layer. see 
the seams of clay in the old route pathways going through there the clay will move to depth outside the rock and through the rock there'll be worms and prior root channels and things like that nodules of carbonate it's pretty amazing porous it's actually quite soft Thanks to uh, Michael and Anthony List Lister there for showing us around uh, their property. Certainly plenty to think about from that. And uh, also thank you to our, uh, our cameraman who got caught uh, caught in the wind there, Shane Gale from, uh, from GPSA. And also thank you to Michael. We'll now move on to Sean Mason from Agronomy Solutions, who's going to give us an overview of soil mapping techniques. Thanks, Sean. Over to you. Thanks, Brad. Um... Hopefully this all comes through okay. Um, I hope I've hit the brief here as well. So I guess following on from Michael, um, soils on York. So we have been a fair bit of um, work in the region and it's great to hear that um, he's working off zones. So um, yeah, it won't be too long here, but this is obviously a lot more um, detail to this. And I thought I'd just give a summary um, of how we go about defining zones. So I agree with Michael that the grower does know a hell of a lot um, of their land. Um, they already probably got zones in their head. So this is probably data just to just to back that up uh, as well. So this is just a table uh, and these are my thoughts around it. Um, just looking at data layers. So that arrow indicates, uh, I guess, all those top five data layers that uh, Michael mentioned. Um, but yeah, it, it all does help lead to I guess accurate pre-season soil sampling. So getting the most out of our soil sampling programs. Um, it's not the nice time of the year to take soil samples up to sowing. Um, we want to make sure that effort's maximised and also interpretation and dollars um, spent at the lab maximised as well. So I just thought to run through an example of all these. So uh, going from probably the easiest Google Earth, we can get a hell of a lot of inf information um, relatively low skill and low cost right up to um, EM38, which might need a bit more interpretation. Grain, grain protein maps is emerging as well. Um, and costs obviously increase um, with memberships and subscriptions. So um, as mentioned, just walk through an example of one of these. Um, this is, I guess, not quite Yorks, but you'd have a look at a Google Earth map um, on, on Yorks. This is just, um, I suppose, yeah, uh, mid north, lower mid north. Um, we can get a hell of a lot of data out of Google Earth already. Um, so again, maximising soil sampling and data, and generating our zones. Um, moving left to right is is the same paddock, but going back in time, this is Google Earth free. Um, you can quite often pick up, uh, I guess, bare earth on the left, and then in, in season capture um, uh, over across a couple of years, um, depending on your crop. So just looking at this triangle paddock, we sampled quite extensively in this paddock. Um, and we can see that there's obviously some uh, lighter country, which isn't producing um, as well as as good as crop early um, as the, the darker patches. So what's going on here and generating zones, it's all worthy of investigation. So um, we did do some intensive sampling. So the first one, sorry, the middle map there, you can see soil pH. Uh, sorry, I'm used to using keyboard. So yeah, just those bare, sorry, the lighter country, carbonate, as Michael mentioned, this is calcium carbonate, pH 7.8. We've got another patch there, 7.8. But in between that, uh, so we've got a neutral pH, so that's more that green patch there, which is moving out of the lighter, lighter gray country. And we've got some highly productive uh, country in the dark zones, which pH drops um, back down to slightly acidic, but sitting nicely at sixes. So immediately we've got some production and some areas of exploration to work out, okay, we're, we're putting our core in these different zones to work out what the crop is doing, um, simply based off Google Earth. Uh, it's quite useful to combine the Google Earth with the NDVI image. Um, particularly early in the NDVI, so um, early vigor 
And again, probably important to look at various crop stages, uh, sorry, crop rotations to look at what the what the early biomass is doing. So this was a nice example on Yorks um, near Sandilands. Um, Brian Hughes has, might recognize this as a um, his pH lime trials. So this is paddock. Um, we've obviously got grey country um, stretched through the middle there, but down the bottom central part of that paddock, we can see a defined red patch. Um, so that more red loam and also on the eastern side, um, truncating out there, we've got some red patches. So uh, immediately going back to the Google Earth image, we can put some cores in here, pH 4.2, we've got an issue. So that red country has been productive. Um, our production has led to acidity. Um, but these naturally carbonate um, lighter country, um, sorry, grey country has actually been able to buffer that pH and we're still sitting at, at seven. So you look at early production in combination with these three areas. Um, there's a couple of um, highlights here. So just looking at lentils on the top right there versus wheat on the same uh, similar growth state, well, sorry, time in the year. Um, but the previous year, we can uh, quickly pick up. There's a couple of different areas of uh, production here. One there, the lentils aren't liking that red country um, on the eastern side, but the wheat isn't doing too bad. And again, that lower central part and that red part, part lentils um, can't handle that acidity, um, but the wheat down the bottom there is in that in that circle patch is, um, ignore that patch to the red, that's actually Brian's trial. So um, obviously established a bit later, but we can see lentils aren't handling acidity. We know they're, they're susceptible to, to pH, low pH. The wheat, um, particularly current um, varieties, um, are quite tolerant to, to soil pH. So again, uh, we're picking up some defined zones across our crop rotations with NDVI and Google Earth combination. So just moving on, um, another layer we can look at to try and get some uh, interpretive soil sampling and um, results. This is just a grain. Uh, yield map, it can be taken from anywhere. Um, this is from this year in the Mallee, unfortunately not York, sorry, but um, a good example of um, the variation we can get uh, in a paddock. So um, the green dots there, each yield record, yield monitor recording there is, is 1.5 to 2. Um, basically going down to the warmer colours is less than half a tonne. Um, so immediately we can look at this grain yield map and go, okay, what's going on here? Again, across different seasons, different crops. And for me, I'd like to stick a zone in there and take a soil sample to see, okay, the crop's done really well there, the characteristics driving that. You may look at an in, in intermediate zone there um, with 0.2. Um, obviously, crop not performing along that northern boundary, 0.3. Um, 0.4 is, again, um, a pretty good production zone. So comparing one and four, so are they the same? And then five, we've got a, a porter intermediate uh, zone there and then moving to the east again. Um, slightly better production, but what, what is generating that, that poor grain yield? And again, combination with the early in season NDVI is, is proving pretty powerful um, with these data layers. So immediately they're, they're the zones that I pick out, but again, everyone uh, can interpret grain yield maps the same. Importantly, I guess um, for residual nutrients um, and fertilizer management, these grain yield maps are, are, are quite key to, to look at uh, rules of thumbs of, of grain removal. So this is kilograms of nutrient per grain, per tonne of grain, um, and for the common crop types that we're growing on York. So um, we can see that nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is emerging on Yorks as well. That's another story, but um, we can see there's, there's quite some decent removals per tonnage if we're up to the five to six tonne of, of cereals. Um, that's a fair, fairly decent nutrient removal. So we can start looking at variation across our paddocks, what's the nutrient removed, um, and then look at these zones and see what's what's driving that different removal. So again, in this paddock, just an example, those green zones are, are taking off up to 45 kilos of nitrogen, six kilos of P, um, poor performing areas. Um, and again, this is always key. I'm really keen to look at why these um, zones aren't performing um, the nutrient removal is, is low, but why is that the case? So um, investigation is, is always in my head to, to work out and try and get our paddocks performing more uniformly. Um, acknowledgement to Ed Scott, because I've nicked this from his uh, GRDC presentation, but 
Um, grain proteins maps is, an, is another data layer that we can use to, to define our soil sampling. So this is in a really intensive case. Uh, so the left-hand side is grain, sorry, grain wheat protein map um, from a site in New South Wales, paddock in New South Wales. Um, they went in and performed grid mapping and zero to 60 soil cores. So quite extensive sampling. So we don't expect um, this sort of intensive sampling routinely, but it was really nice to see that the growth, the wheat protein um, on the left-hand side there from 2019 and the soil profile in uh, following that matched in most cases. So uh, when I say matched, low protein was actually low profile in. So um, those sort of zones, so particularly the, the bottom uh, eastern side of that paddock, um, have we been feeding enough? Um, we've got low protein, low profile, profile in. Um, have we been feeding that enough? Again, we've got um, quite high patches of protein and large residual nitrogen. So there's a soil dynamic there that's holding our nitrogen in. We're not getting the removal uh, potentially off. So um, really neat stuff to match our soil sampling with grain protein. Um, and I think the next step, don't forget um, your yield maps as well. So if we had a grain yield map alongside of this, we could see the production uh, of those areas. Are the grain high proteins limited by something? Um, have we underdone the, the, the lower part or the lower protein uh, parts of those paddocks? So, um, and looking at removals, we can quite easily get protein as nitrogen content. So we can get a yield by protein um, and actually get an, a nitrogen removal map if we're looking at sort of replacement and building and or matching end banks. So obviously the end bank theory um, is is being popular and trialling uh, with GRDC funding. So um, that's sort of the progression of, of wheat, tank, wheat protein maps and with our new headers. Um, so this is, again, stolen a bit of data, but um, this is Pete, um, obviously very active on your peninsula. Um, and this is a, a paddock from York. So uh, defining zones from EM38, so scooting over our paddocks with the EM38 and Pete has generated um, seven zones here um, on, your, on the side of the York Peninsula. Um, low conductivity EM38, very simply, there's probably um, a lot more to it, but in this case, I'll just explain low conductivity is, is sort of sands. Um, progressing to the cooler colours is higher conductivity of the EM um, feedback, um, and that indicates the, the heavier soil types, clays, and potentially some constraints. So. We can actually define or zone our paddocks with the EM38s. Um, sevens, um, quite a few, but um, in terms of sort of water holding capacity and, and plant available water. So um, Pete did this night, neat example um, of barley way back in 2003, but a nice uh, October, uh, 45 mil barley's actually uh, finished off quite well and the heavier country has actually out yielded the lighter country. Um, flip that to the year after and canola on a very dry finish um, in October. It's an important window. Um, we can obviously see the sands are, are hanging on to or supply more water and, and, and the heavier soils are, are crashing out quite badly with, with the thirsty canola. So that's a management of zones, um, obviously over crop seasons and, and different season variability. So EM38. Um, so this all leads to pre-season soil sampling. So um, hopefully not take too much time, but just finish off with an example of what we're doing on Yorks and particularly with Sam Trengove and how it's important to define these zones. Um, so this is a paddock, again, lower mid-north, but very um, applicable to York Peninsula. Um, Sam's identified this paddock, uh, so he's performed an NDVI um, central image there. Um, he's done a Verus, his Verus machine run over it with the matching soil pH map on the right-hand side. So. Um, looking at NDVI back in 2018, he quickly pointed out or worked out that the actual lower NDVI cereal production was matching um, the actual alkaline patches um, of, of his various machines. So again, looking at Google Earth on that image in the background, you can see those data points and that poor NDVI is matching with that lighter country again. Um, and to me, that's that's a quick alert. Um, that that's alkaline and calcareous. And um, this is a phosphorus example, but um, it was actually driven by different phosphorus requirements across this paddock. So, um, so picking out those four zones, Sam put in four replicated phosphorus trials, um, which is quite neat. Um, and I just threw in an example of, okay, traditionally we may have done a transect over there, 
um, accumulating four sample cores um, just going from gate, so bottom gate there to a, to a gate on the on the western side. Um, we could also run another transect across there. There's another gate up, up the northern end. Um, and if you look at the maps, those transects, what information are we actually missing from just merging that that transect and combining those cores? So um, this is why we're moving into zonal, and hopefully the transect method is is dead and buried. But um, and again, if you're moving to that other gate, you're probably picking up a fair bit of acidity soil um, and quite good production. And we may be missing out why these areas um, to the west are, aren't performing. So just uh, very quick, um, this was phosphorus, sorry, um, but very applicable to yorks and, and phosphorus requirements there. Um, so points one and two were in the alkaline patch. They weren't performing that well. Cobalt P was low, PBI was high, um, and DGT in line with cobalt was low. Um, points three and four were in that lower, um, slightly acidic zone. Good production, P reserves really good, driven by low PBI, so really good fertilizer efficiency, um, DGT matching cobalt. So, um, if we were to look at a transect and combine these four zones, we are at a neutral pH. The P is pretty good, cobalt is up near 40. Um, so we actually are missing out that information that those poor performing areas were driven by low P. So just doing some partial gross margins in the background. Uh, if we acted on these zones one and two and added the P required, we're getting a cluster surplus of $70 per hectare. Uh, if we're looking at these uh, neutral slightly acidic position three and four and sort of refining our P requirements and um, actually cutting back a little bit, we can get, um, ex well, sorry, five to $10 per hectare in, in fertilizer savings. So um, as a whole, the zonal um, approach is, is, is a winner for, for this example in this area, particularly the Yorks. And just to finish off with some images in case that um, hasn't gone through, but this is another case of Sam's um, barley paddock. Uh, again, we've got this lighter country, Google Earth on the left-hand side. He's put in four response trials based off zones of um, NDVI and pH. Um, so point A down the bottom there is this replicated trial here with a magnificent phosphorus response, it was huge. Uh, move to this actually bottom right capture is uh, position D. So we're in that better production country out of that calcareous zone. We can't actually see a phosphorus response to um, to P increasing P. So um, you start looking at some gross margins on that. This was a, a high grain price year, um, two tonne per hectare we got with, with uh, obviously we don't go on a nil, but um, we, we're going to increase the two tonnes um, from the nil up to four kilos of P. Our return minus MAP cost is around about some a hectare, so that's pretty good. Um, and again, that other zone where we've actually got picked out really good residual P, no increase in yields, and our return is is potentially fertilizer savings from cutting back from um, potentially replacement back down to to yeah something like when fertilizer prices go through the roof, whether we can actually cut back just to some starter P. So that's, uh, sorry, just a um, quick comment about grids. Ollie might have a comment about this. Um, so just doing some real quick analysis and my thoughts. So I just did an example of um, paddock of 70 hectares. Um, grid sampling is popular. I've done a, a pH cations cobalt P combination here. So it costs roughly maybe about $2,000, might be a bit under that on a one hectare grid sample. Um, two Every two hectares, that's come down to about $1,000. Pros to me, spatial information. Obviously, we've got a lot of information in, in a short space, um, area space and paddocks. Uh, pH, we can do liming, um, very high spatial liming requirements. We've got cation data, but I guess with this, this amount of samples, we are losing with expense, potential information, no PBI, so phosphorus buffering index and fixation indications, no constraints at depth, and obviously no N below that zero to 10. So that's obviously zero to 10. So. Looking at zones and, and setting up an example that I've just shown, um, just for example, for $2,000, we can do approximately five zones by four depths. So that's quite detailed depth information or 10 zones by two depths. So it's like zero to 10, 10 to 60. Um, pros, we can get profile N here, plant of our water constraints or nutrients. Um, I guess some cons, we are losing some of that spatial question. I guess the question is looking at that, those spatial variability across the paddock, um, whether those zones are enough, but um, depends on how we act on these zones and and variable rate. So, um, and I guess we can start including maybe some inherent soil properties with our grid sampling to actually start supporting our zonal 
development and um, where to take our next calls and repeated calls to see how our management is going with with nutrient fluctuations. So I think that's all for me, Brad. So um, hopefully not too much time and hopefully that hit the brief. Thanks, Sean. Uh, really uh, interesting insights there. And we're actually going to throw back to Sean, who's going to take us through uh, some SAGIT trials, uh, looking at the benefits of on-row sowing on the York Peninsula. So uh, we'll throw back to you, Sean, to touch on uh, on those SAGIT trials. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, – this is quite new. Um, and, again, thanks for SAGIT and um, GPSA for the opportunity to present this. Hopefully it won't be too long take up too much time again um but yeah this is quite exciting um hopefully yeah some some more comms will come out but this is a great opportunity to showcase uh what we've been doing with uh central ag solutions so yeah i want to acknowledge um sam holmes and central ag for driving this um and obviously the support from sagat again so uh on row sowing benefits your peninsula i guess uh and i guess what are the benefits what are the drivers uh yeah, we, we know on row sowing benefits for, say, Mallee country and, and sands and non weddings uh, in previous doubles. But I guess the story started with um, one of Sam's clients um, purchasing a new um, guidance system, sowing system, uh, and started trialing uh, off his own back. Basically, left hand side is, is into row sowing, so common practice. I know we our sowing operations do bounce around between rows and furrows. Um, but with this guidance system, so he could actually get straight onto that stubble, previous stubble row. So um, Sam, quickly, it was quite obvious to work out um, what was happening. We were getting significant benefits of emergence and early vigour um, with this cereal crop um, with on-row there, sorry, on-row on the right-hand side and obviously the patchiness of, um, of inter-row inter sowing on the left. So um, this is where we are, Port Victoria, um, and we tried to, well, we, I was really keen on this. Sam thought it might have been residual phosphorus. Um, this is pea hungry ground near Port Victoria. Um, so we did some quick cores um, when we quickly realised um, this, I suppose this um, on-road versus off-road translated to about a tonne um, at maturity with yield maps. So um, we thought, what the hell's going on here? We need to investigate. So. We did some cores in this paddock, just off row, on row, um, a poor area and a, and a better area. Um, what quickly raised to my eye was, um, if you look at the nitrate ends there, um, the surface of the poor um, off rows had a substantial nitrogen there. Um, the phosphorus was, wasn't too bad. It didn't fluctuate too much, but I guess the obvious one for here and, and being coastal was that the EC uh, one to five here, so important to obviously convert that to ECSE as well with texture. But in this case, the, the EC was jumping out of the ground to me, um, no pun intended, but um, the off row was actually a lot higher surface salt, so it was full throw compared to those same conditions um, on row. So um, we're keen to investigate and confirm this uh, with obviously replicated trials. So we did rep trials. We've done on-farm demos and we've done a, um, Sam's done a really nice survey along York's to just to see um, the on-road, off-road soil property effects. So very quickly, um, two replicated trolls um, that I'll talk about. Uh, site one uh, was barley 22 lentil this year and site two just um, north of Port Victoria uh, lentil last year into barley. This year, just some happy snaps uh, of the trolls. Um, the lentil paddock on the southern Port Victoria site, you can see very obvious the left-hand side, um, the off-row plus furt effect, um, which I'll go into more detail, uh, versus the on-row no fertiliser effect in this in this area. So it's obviously a, a pretty good benefit of early grown, early biomass lentils. Um, on the right-hand side, we moved to the barley site this year. Um, these are both on-row, but we've got a very phosphorus-hungry ground. So... Um, a nil P on the right hand side, and um, and that's 50 units of P. Obviously, research trials we can throw a lot of um, P at this, so and we have just to maximise yields. Um, so a bit of data here. Sorry, I walked through. Uh, so this is site one in 22. Um, Sam did some quite intensive sampling. So this is just zero to ten, but we did look at stratification of on row versus off row. Um, just looking at the significant difference effects, moisture, we, we 
commonly know that Onroe has got moisture benefits. So we've got about a 1% increase, so not a huge amount, but potentially important. This surface nitrogen in the off rows is huge. So you talk about nitrogen background in and, and lentil production, that's that's quite key here. Um, site two, the lentil one in 22 is even um, bigger difference. So that those nitrogen nitrates at the surface are huge. Phosphorus, not much difference. So we talk about residual N off versus on. The actual on was a bit lower for the first site, site one. Um, but again, this EC and again, the conversion of EC, um, SE should be. Um, yeah, the difference of off row versus on row was was quite powerful. Um, and in, in line with that was was sodium percentage as well. So we have got very different soil characteristics or soil conditions uh, that we're sowing in between on and off. So does that matter? Uh, so this is site one barley. So this is the lower EC site. So um, on row was 0.28, off row was 0.45. So you might say that that's, I think the cutoff is about 0.6 for cereals. So this is barley. This is our P response with on row darker green, a nice uh, phosphorus utilization up to 20 P, um, probably maxes out there up to 4.5 ton. Conversely, if we did that on the inter row um, of the previous stubble line, um, yeah, with that, that's effectively a flat line um, and bounces around that three and a half ton, maybe slightly higher. So that's a ton difference just in that sweet spot of 20 units of P. So um, pretty good, significant, well, significant story there that the benefits of on row um, is a nicer environment and utilization of P um, is, is a lot better. So just pulling out the stats, everyone loves the stats. So um, yeah, combining all those P rates, the on row and inter row difference is about um, half a ton. But again, we get bigger differences along that P response curve. Um, and obviously we've got a, a significant P response up to that um, 50 units of P. Lentils was always struggling. So this is the higher EC site. So uh, 1.24 versus 3.33 off. As soon as we started throwing any furt um, near the seed with lentils in a higher salt background, the, the crop vigor and, and really was for, was affected. So um, the NDVIs actually um, started going down any, any time we added furt. Um, this is the grain yield, so it did sort of bounce back a bit. Um, but we can see that on-row um, versus off-row um, effect, inter-row, I've called it here, um, for lentils at that higher salt site. So... Again, backing up those pictures and, and what the growers saw um, with this um, strip trial. So again, we're getting about 400 um, kilograms per hectare increase in, in overall um, on-row sowing versus intro and sowing um, with lentils. So um, hot off the press for this year, we, um, like I mentioned, we went lentil onto barley site and barley onto the lentil site. So the lower EC site, uh, this is lentil yields. And we've got a residual, so we've gone on row, on row, on row, um, effectively versus off row, off row, off row, um, continued that process. And I guess quickly, you haven't done any stats. So these came through last week, sorry, um, but hopefully these will come out significant. So um, the lower EC site, we're getting significant responses to P with the lentils. So as with the barley in 22, again, it's with the off row, as soon as we, throw any furt at it, it just bounces around and potentially a negative effect there. So this is just a difference between on-row and off-row for each um, P treatment there. So 20 units of P on the lentils, we've got um, yeah, 0.67 tonne per hectare difference. So um, pretty interesting story there and utilisation again of P. The barley on the high EC site, so this is where the lentils pretty much crashed in 22 with fertiliser. Um, we got a nice P response, which is good, um, but the on-row, off-row effect for the second year was was coming through again. So again, about half a ton bouncing around with our P rates um, of barley yield. So again, apologies, but I'll I'll get ready and do my stats this week to confirm this. But um, yeah, looks looks to be a significant effect here. So just summing up. Uh, so again, obviously coastal uh, Port Victoria there, uh, we have done demos across on the other side of uh, Drossen and those demos are, um, we are seeing that, that on-row effect, positive on-row effect as well. So Sam's was busy and saw how far do these benefits potentially go. Um, so this is just a survey of, um, again, stratification, but these are just zero to tens with our current EC critical. So again, I'll mention anything above up to 0.6 for cereals, we think is okay. Um, potentially that might need to be refined, I think. 
Um, so off-road conditions on the left-hand side, um, so those numbers are quite small, but maybe just use the colours versus the on-row um, next to it. Hopefully you can see that the differences um, between the EC um, was quite significant and we are getting a hell of a lot more salty environments by sowing off-row uh, versus on-row um, in a lot of these locations. So um, hopefully we can refine these numbers with, with toxicology um, studies that are happening at the moment. Um, EC thresholds that are produced by soil mate, um, back paddock acknowledgement um, and any other research or finds. We've got beans, uh, wheat, barley, um, haven't been able to find any data on on sort of salt thresholds for, for lentils. There is for protection studies going on, um, but effectively no salinity thresholds. So these may actually, these green colours may actually, a lot of them pull back to to alerts of orange and, and reds um, with that information. So that's happening now, as I mentioned. So, um, yeah, that's a quick snapshot of that project. So just what are the drivers with question marks? Hopefully we've got um, some answers to that to that question. Moisture is an obvious one. We've got surface salt, um, so lower levels on previous double lines. Um, adding more salt or fertiliser to moderate elevated salt salinity or any elevated soil levels will uh, reduce crop emer emergence and early vigour. And I guess the combination of decreased salt, increased moisture increases our crop um, ability to utilise pea sources in these soils. Uh, a couple of questions that may pop up. Sorry if I've sort of tweaked anyone um, prior. Um, I guess how long does it last? So it's two seasons so far. Does it come back to neutral eventually? Uh, like I mentioned, pulse thresholds for salt salinity. We don't really know that too well. Um, and question mark, what's the best fertilizer management options for low P soils across pulse cereal rotations in these soil environments? So um, hopefully that was of interest and of local significance. Um, but yeah, happy to obviously answer questions and um, Sam Holmes is, who's active on, on Yorks as well. So thanks again for the opportunity. Thanks again, Sean. Uh, really interesting uh, research up there and uh, great to see uh, that Saget project uh, pushing along. We'll keep moving on to Brian Hughes from Perza, who's going to run through considerations uh, for soil health. Uh, yeah, this talk will be about the uh, considerations for soil health on the York Peninsula. And it's really come out of, I suppose, uh, a lot of interest in soil health. Um, and I'll talk a bit about um, just how you define that, a little bit on... on uh, the limitations on, on your peninsula that you see in some of the soils. And, uh, and this is a, a little bit on testing and a bit on carbon and, and sort of runs through these aspects of it. Um, I mean, it's probably a pretty uh, quick and dirty look at the whole thing. Um, you know, when you're looking at soil health, you're looking at the, the physical, chemical, biological aspects of the soil. Um, we'll talk about limitations and, and, you know, most soils in South Australia have natural limitations, uh, how you, uh, in some cases, are induced limitations. And I suppose I'll be focused much more on agricultural context. Uh, so I'm looking at you know, soil health from a, an optimum production um, and the, the sort of, uh, uh, I suppose, water movement and nutrient movement for crops are very important for part of that. But there, you know, there are other reasons for, for soil health which are much more environmentally focused. Um, things like carbon capture probably fit into the agricultural world as well. But, but um, in, in other cases, it, it's a bit different to that. Uh, so just running through... Uh, generally, soil health is a, is um, the capacity of the soil to function as a as a living system in relation to its natural capacity. And, and there's no universal soil health benchmarks. As I said, we mentioned an ag system is is different. How you define that? You know, the same soil under agricultural system compared to a natural system. And and I suppose it, it's made up of a range of things, from you know uh, being profitable from an point of view, being resilient during droughts, um, biologically productive, uh, having some environmental quality, and, and also uh, plant and animal and human health aspects it covers. So you're not creating other issues when you're, you're growing things on that on that healthy soil, which may affect health issues of the, the plant or human. Um, and there's really five sort of key functions, um, uh, I suppose, of soil. You, you've got you know, your plant productivity, and it's absorbing CO2 as it does that. Um, there's you know, greenhouse gas mitigation, so you, you know, you're you capturing some of the, the CO2. A lot of that ends up back in the atmosphere, but you do capture some. Um, you, you know, the soil provides, a, I suppose, an energy source for, for biological organisms. It allows nutrients and things to cycle, how it's stored, and, and the water 
uh, water is part of that as well. So the, the circulation of water and the water holding capacity are important bits. And you know, basically, if you, if you look at, at soil, you know, what is it really? There's, you know, in some cases, there's gravel-sized particles. There's what we call sand-sized particles. Silt and clay are, are the three particle sizes. Um, the clay and silt are very small, um, and 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 getting down into into microns. Um, and I, and I suppose on your clinician, the other things to think about, you know, what else is in your soil? There, there's organic matter, there's air, there's water, and a lot of your clinician soils is actually lime in the soil as well, um, and and it can be one of the constituents of the soil. Um, it's a precious resource. You know, we, we see figures of you know hundred years plus to create one centimeter of soil. So when you lose it, it takes a long time to get it back. And I suppose you know when we're looking through the the uh, the aim is to sort of you know characterize your soil, lay out to assess it against benchmarks or criteria. There's a range of basic things you can do, including things like soil texture and color, um, the depth of layers are very important. Um, field pH down the profile, so understanding your pH profile down the profile, uh, and then looking at I suppose the impacts of that soil and things on the depth of the roots, whether there's a, a restricting layer, and understanding those constraints on the soil, um, and you, you can see sort of pictures of different soils so there just showing that and the variability of soils across south australia we, we cover pretty well most of the soil orders in the world i suppose within south australia um general limitations to, to your clinician soils might, might include the the sandiness that's a water repellent soil um whether there's a sodic or dispersive layer often a, a clay layer underneath whether there's shallow limestone or cow creek present the amount of amount of lime and where it's distributed through the profile if it's free lime and um, the ph the acidity and the alkalinity which is which is linked to the lime but but can be is, is independent of in some cases too and whether that soil has got any sort of subsoil constraints and that they can be mostly natural uh, but, but they still have an impact on on growth um some of the key soils that you see on your peninsula so you know down the bottom uh calcareous sand um a loamy sand to sand it has a shell shelly form under the microscope you can have very high carbonate levels on these soils up to 80 percent in some cases and it consistently has issues with some of the nutrients because of that high, you know, things like manganese phosphorus uh, zinc iron um, are all tied up with the carbonate percentage in those soils um, don't tend to see much issue with, with subsoil bolt boron or salt um, another soil that we we see Commonly on your peninsula is calcareous sandy loams and loams, um, and probably the you know the, the most dominant soil type there, I suppose. Uh, and it, and loamy sand through the loam texture on the surface it has some carbonate levels, and I'll talk a bit more of those as we go. Can be high carbonate, um, but more like you know greater than ten percent, uh, not not up to sort of the levels of calcareous sand. Um, Consistent issues again with phosphorus getting tied up, but not as much with the trace elements. And sometimes we see subsoil issues with, with boron salt um, or high pH in the subsoils. And and I suppose linked to that one is is a, is a clay version, which is the calcareous clay loam. Again, over um, uh, carbonate levels and and over clay as well. This example I put down here, which is the the soil in here, which is a passable field day site. You know, at 36 centimetres deep on that soil, you start getting into high levels of boron, high pH, high exchangeable sodium. The salt levels aren't too bad. So so you tend to find uh, subsoil toxicities are probably the issue that you see on this soil more so than anything else. And and um, often the, the depth above those toxic layers. Um, so, you know, class one is really refers to the fine carbonate and clay matrix and often can be associated with poor drainage and poor root growth into that layer. Um, the class two is is the laminar sheet or boulder calcrete, cal and depending on the cracking on that, how much it's fractured, it can be a restriction to to root growth in its own right. Uh, um, class three A, B, and C are, are increasing amounts of sort of uh, carbonate uh, fragments and, and and in sort of light sand to like clay, um, and and I suppose the uh, the the three A is less than thirty percent, three B thirty to sixty percent, and three C. Uh, greater than 60 and you do tend to find in the 3b and 3c ones that the, the roots will actually grow through that rubby material quite well um, sometimes once you get underneath that you, there are problems with, with uh, drainage or root growth or subsoil toxicities but you often find that that broken stuff 
the, the research go through it quite well. And then the, the fourth class, which we don't see a lot of, um, particularly on York Peninsula, is the fine carbon in a, in a sandy matrix, which is more common on deep sand. Another soil type seen in patches uh, around, around Stansbury and, and north of uh, uh, Kadena, I suppose, is the Sandover clay. Um, can be quite a, a sandy surface, can be water repellent, often has a poorly structured clay underneath, which can disperse. I'll show a picture of that in a minute. Um, sometimes issues with, with, with subsoil boron, high, high pH and salt. And, and I suppose the, the, the deeper topsoils have a much more bleached A2. Um, and, and in those cases, we have seen the development of hard pans on these soils quite common and, and responses to things like ripping or, or delving. Um, again, these soils can have problems with, with topsoil and subsoil acidity. And I suppose the, the, the last broad group I've talked talk about is the sandy loam to loams over clay. Um, again, common in the, in the uh, Petersville and some of those more central York Peninsula districts. Um, key characteristics, sandy loam to, to uh, surface over a clay. The clay can be poorly structured at times. It's not always. It can be quite well structured. And, and again, depending on the rainfall and some other factors, it can have subsoil constraints. And this soil in particular, we have seen issues linked to um, acidification of the topsoil layers uh, above the clay. And just some examples of those, uh, you know, we've all seen the the, the trog, trog, sorry, pH, uh, pH graph by nutrient availability. And you can see that when the soils are very acid, you, you're getting uh, things like calcium, magnesium, um, molybdenum, all becoming much less as the soils are becoming very alkaline. You, you also see things with problems with, with um, iron, manganese, in particular, and copper and zinc becoming quite rare. So, so that understanding that pH profile uh, in uh, on your peninsula, you can see you know paddocks that you you see soils range from you know four and a half through to nine in the, in the same paddock. Um, just a shot there of subsoil boron toxicity showing up in barley with the sort of symptoms that you see of boron toxicity, which is that the yellowing sort of splotches on the leaf. There's a, a shot down here which, which really links to dispersive clays uh, as as you can see, the, the clay is getting a bit of dispersion, uh, quite a bit of dispersion, and then full dispersion in this the, the very bottom right-hand corner there. Um, so a little bit now on improving and testing YP soils. Um, so and, and we'll talk a bit about um, uh, how, how you go about understanding those limitations, uh, overcoming them, they're economic, I suppose, we've talked about, uh, a bit on carbon and microbial activities. And... The general sort of stuff, I suppose, if you're looking at soil health is, you know, you've got chemical, physical, and bio biological components of that. Um, the uh, the chemical stuff is is the, you know, um, pH, low toxicities of nutrients, a sufficient source of nutrients, and cation exchange. Uh, physical structure includes the ability for air and water to move back, move through, um, roots having good access, having a stable sort of structure. And then I suppose for biological, you really need to have some good food supply, uh, have a diverse biological uh, activity there, populations there, and, and also the ability to, to suppress diseases. Um, the first one is really you know, how, how do you aim to optimise your production of food and fibre? Uh, and I suppose the the, um, the productivity of food and fibre aspects of this. So, so this is really all about you know, you can make a good healthy soil if you if you're getting more production off that. Uh, if you can grow more stuff uh, in terms of yield or dry matter, um, you can grow, you can run more stock. You will actually find that you're cycling more more general nutrients. And you know, I suppose traditionally the way people have assessed some of those things is looked at things like your potential models. Uh, there, there are grazing versions of that. You know, the French Schultz or the Epson type models. Water infiltration storage uh, is the second bit, like aim to improve the soil structure so you can get better movement of, of water and get more, more storage in the soil. And visually, you know, the simple measures you can look at is the, is the structure, um, size and arrangement of the peds. Uh, if you're getting those sort of little uh, pea-sized peds in your structure, it's a good thing. If it's coming out at big blocks, <laughs> you know you've got a structural problem. Uh, you can do infiltration tests, and there's a, just an example up there of a basic infiltration test measuring the, the speed the water goes into the soil, uh, or you can go into sort of uh, um, measuring, I suppose, the strength and density of the soil, uh, things like bulk density assessment, which, which is the, the volume of 
sold in a certain fixed um, container. And and depending on what levels they are, uh, the you know once you get to a certain level with, with things like bulk density, the roots don't grow well through that. Just an example, which is probably more relevant to deep for sand, it, you know, using things like penetrometers, uh, you can actually measure the strength of that soil as you go down through the profile. You know, around about two thousand five hundred kilopascals is is the is the strength that you want to, I suppose, where soils have uh, problems with, with their subsoils uh, and roots have problems pushing through those layers. And that's just an example there on the right of a, of a, from Butte, I suppose, of you know, responses to deep ripping, inclusion, ripping and spading from a, a trial of Sam Tringo's. Um, soil organisms, um, again, the aim is understanding and targeted improvement um, of the diversity, so the range of stuff, and also the, the amount, again, uh, becoming very popular, but it's actually quite difficult to work out what the best test to use for some of these the, the biological aspects of the soil are. Uh, there are things like visual assessment, um, and you've heard of uh, cotton strips and the undies test and various things, um, where you put them in, see how quickly they, they get broken down. Um, there's there's a range of sort of labs that are now offering simple um, tests to do with biological activity or, or general groupings of, of, of soil biology, um, and often you find that they relate very much to how much food there is in, in that, that sample that goes up. Uh, um, and then I suppose there's more specialised measures becoming where they're looking at particular um, measures of respiration or the carbon nitrogen of microbes, the abundant and diversity of species and functional groups, or the things like the, you know the DNA assessment of certain disease-related uh, organisms, or, or, or even looking at the DNA assessment in terms of soil health. So, you know whether there's got enough good nematodes in that soil. Um, Nutrient cycling, which is probably the more traditional way that people have looked at their, their soils. You know, certainly plant tissue testing is, is well established in South Australia um, and it's really good for, for comparative type testing and, and picking up uh, trace element problems in some cases. Um, and there's an interest in, in sort of developing SAP tests a bit further. Um, soil tests have actually been used for, you know, very, for pH, organic carbon, uh, the major nutrients, for, for your clinician, if you've got calcareous soils, if you're looking at phosphorus, it's a really useful thing to do what they call the DGTP test, which is a new phosphorus test, particularly suitable for, for calcareous soils. Uh, and as we've seen some really good results from those when the when the traditional testing tell, tells us there's plenty of stuff there. Uh, things like exchange or cations um, give us an overall measure of fertility, but also whether there's any uh, too much sodium in the, in the soil leading to structural problems. Uh, trace amount soil testing is, is probably less developed than the plant tissue testing and gives you a bit of a feel. Um, uh, so things like uh, copper, zinc, manganese, uh, and I suppose iron, aluminium, a bit in the same. But again, soil testing is very good for picking up toxicities of boron or sodium or chloride. And a little bit on greenhouse gas. So, so there's certainly a lot of interest in, you know, can we increase soil organic carbon? Um, and the, the problem we, you sort of have with that a little bit is that... Uh, there's certainly organic carbon tests, but for a really healthy soil, we want the organic matter to actually improve the function of the soil. So we want the, the soil biology to break things down, improve the nutrient cycling and water holding video. However, for greenhouse gas, we want to store the carbon. <laughs> and these things, while they have similarities about them, they, they don't necessarily mean the same things happening. So, so you can have a really active um, breakdown process um, and... Um, Lots of things happening in the soil, and and doing good. That you know the breakdown products of that soil biology are actually really useful for the soil, but you may not be increasing the carbon at the same time. Um, some data that Amanda Chappelle put together, looking at all the old soil testing from 1990 to 2007. So across South Australia, uh, we have seen an increase in carbon levels. This is just looking at all the soil testing data. We've got that data to about 2007. Then the, the uh, state soil testing lab disappeared. And what we don't quite know is have we reached an equilibrium? Have we progressed more, particularly since no till came in in those sort of early 2000s, I suppose, um, where we've seen a lot more stubble retained and, and reduced cultivation. Through that project, she also had a range of um, ag, district, ag district benchmarks that she's put together, and these are based on the texture of the soil. So, so things like um, understanding, and this is again related to 0 to 10 sampling, so loamy sand, sandy loam through to clay. Um, the 25% level is basically meaning that this is the 25% or, 
or less figure. So, so in terms of so that the lower the lower end, if you're up here at seventy five percent, you can see these figures are much higher. So you're at seventy five up to the hundred percent or the hundred hundred percent is really the highest figures you had in that data set. And, and it does raise that question: if you're already up high, um, you know how far more can you go? I suppose. Um, so the opportunity to increase soil organic carbon depends on the starting point um, and the capacity to store more organic carbon texture, rainfall, moisture, and temperature, uh, which which affects the, I suppose the growth and the and the breakdown, ability to, to grow, apply sufficient organic carbon inputs, and sufficient nutrition to grow the biomass uh, to enable the transformations through to these particular organic carbon or humus organic carbon, which will last a lot longer in the soil and, and there's some sort of ratio that Clive Kirby and Cicero put together, you know, how much nutrient you need to do that. Um, so generally, yeah, but just to finish off, you know, improving soil health. So we, you know, there's some improving plant growth, managing limitations. I think well, I've got through um, understanding where you're at in terms of the starting point. Are you already up at a fairly high level? Have you got room to move, I suppose, and improve? You know, various amendments can certainly, by correcting your soils in terms of adding clay to water and sand or, or liming it, has that ability to improve the growth. Um, improve bio biological activity by adding organic materials, uh, including there's a whole range of stuff, compost stubble, biochar, et cetera, green manures, and, and, and certainly the other one, which is certainly in there, is reduced or no-till. I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Brian. Uh, a lot to think about there when it, when it comes to soil health. Um, our last presenter of the day is Ollie Madgett, who's going to take us through uh, soil sampling. Um, Ollie's also doing a project with uh, with GPSAs, which he'll, uh, he'll talk about too. Um, over to you, Ollie. Brilliant. Thanks, Brad. And hello, everybody. So obviously, um, the theme of today was around um, sustainability. So obviously, sustainability reporting is, is kind of one of the um, major areas that you're getting at least a lot of noise around at the moment as producers. And I just wanted to quickly talk through one of the projects that I work on uh, in partnership with GPSA. So we've, we're have we collaborating um, at Farm Lab with GPSA on the National Soil Carbon Innovation Challenge. And that challenge basically was created off the back of the fact that currently, um, in order for you as producers to baseline your soil carbon uh, to a level that you could have real confidence in in those results, uh, it is prohibitively expensive for most producers to go through that step. So, um, and that's as you as you'll know, you know, as farmers on the YP, you know, probably have a lot of variability, and in order to actually um, have uh, confidence in those in in those stock levels, you have to take a significant number of physical soil cores to actually really rigorously and robustly know how much carbon you have there. So, federal government put out this challenge and put some funding out to um, for innovators and researchers to um, test and prove out technology that can help to reduce that cost. So, um, just on the left, uh, that's the current. So, at the moment, the current methodology that we have in soil carbon in Australia is called the 2021 soil carbon methodology. Uh, physical soil samples are basically the gold standard of truth at the moment. So that's, as I said before, what is leading to these high costs is um, because you'd need to take a significant amount of samples to pick up that variability. Um, our project's not trying to do away with soil sampling. We still believe that physical soil sampling is gonna be incredibly important going forwards. Um, but we're working to use those physical soil samples to help to uh, localize a carbon model. So help to inform a model of carbon. So it's not just those individual cores, the data from those individual cores is getting extrapolated out over the uh, over your farm. So, um, you know, as, as with so many things in this world, um, you know, it's a critical mass of data that's needed to really drive this drive this innovation forwards. And it's data that we don't currently have here in Australia. So in our work uh, with GPSA and with other bodies all around Australia, 
we are baselining um, over 400 farms, uh, 80 of which are going to be in South Australia. And actually, I think we've nearly got 40 uh, cropping producers across SA now in the project. I will throw a URL up at the end of this, just in case you are um, able to hopefully be one of the last people to get in if you would like us to, to assist you to um, baseline your soils. So yeah, we're basically putting in place about 20,000 soil samples. Those samples will be um, created in, and they're being sampled in a, in a um, consistent manner, uh, in a way that the data is structured so that it can be used really effectively and efficiently by um, other developers and other researchers. So it's really empowering us going forwards. So just as a quick step through of, um, you know, how you do put in place a baseline for your farm. So um, I'm going to use FarmLab as an example software here, but basically in FarmLab is a tool that typically agronomists would use. So within the FarmLab tools and within the platform, we have uh, a layer, which is all the cadastral maps of South Australia. So the way that we first set up a sampling project is we get the lot and DP numbers off the farmer so that we under, so that we identify their legal um, land title um, that they own. And then we create carbon estimation areas uh, that sit within those cadastral boundaries. So here we've actually created two carbon estimation areas for our research project because there's there's a difference between those two CAs. One of them is a uh, predominantly in a uh, cropping cycle and the other's um, pasture. So that was the reason why we wanted to create these two CAs. But you, but yeah, CAs carbon estimation area, and uh, we then uh, under the current methodology. It's random stratified sampling. So we use um, various data layers, so mapping layers to help us to create those strata. So as Sean was uh, mentioning in his presentation, it might you know, be NDVI that we use as a guide for how you, you know, your farm should be broken up into sampling areas. Or there are other layers that are quite useful sometimes, like um, one's called topographic wetness index, just looking at how water is moving across your farmland. Um, it's often a strong indicator of how carbon, where carbon will also be at different rates. But a lot of this kind of creating of the strata, um, as Michael Ayer said at the beginning, is actually just sitting down with a farmer and making sure that when we use remote sense data to help do a first pass, uh, that it actually kind of ground truths with what the farmer knows about their own land and how they feel that that carbon is likely to be distributed. So basically create these strata and then um, um, under the methodology, we then have a way of randomly generating points out across those sampling areas. So yeah, random stratified sampling. Uh, with FarmLab, we actually work a lot with Amanda Chappelle in South Australia and the Persa and Saudi teams to do a lot of our soil sampling. So they'll be uh, on the YP over the next couple of months, kind of post harvest doing a lot of sampling for us. So they use FarmLab to uh, help them to accurately navigate to each of those points. And we uh, have to be like the way we set it up is we, we generally try to be about a meter accurate. So we use a external GPS receiver to give us sort of sub meter accuracy. It's not quite what you need in kind of RTK level, but um, more accurate than a phone so that we can know that we've actually gone and we're recording where we actually do take that physical source sample. We take it on our project either down to 60 centimeters or down to a, or down to a meter and then under the Australian methodology, the minimum that we need to quantify is um, zero centimeters to 30 centimeters. But so that's one sample that we'll take out of that core and we'll measure that out. And then everything from 30 centimeters down, either to when we get to the depth we're looking for or until we hit um, uh, kind of an, um, an impermanent, impenetrable layer uh, where we'll stop, we then measure out the, the, the rest of the depth of that core. Those go into sampling bags. And again, the, the Persa Sadi team will just scan those bags. So it geo references where those samples have come from. 
these samples actually this is apal labs here in adelaide where a lot of our samples go into so there is a uh, it's called the cfi um uh, test so the cfi test is the kind of um official carbon testing um uh, suite uh that links into the methodology here so all of our samples go under go through those tests so they get uh, air, they get air dried uh, for a couple of days and then they get ground and they sieve out um, any materials that are above two mils so that we then kind of have a um, a fine earth uh, sample that goes, basically gets uh, measured for its bulk, uh, its, me its mass gets measured to, to create the bulk density component of the result. And then it goes into this machine called a, called a LECO machine and it undergoes a LECO test, which is basically um igniting that 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 soil uh, and then recording the change um as the as the carbon gas is off so um basically with people like apal labs we have a, a connection into them so uh, in reverse as well so as they complete all their lab tests so they um automatically post data back to farm lab and that enables us in our analytics platform to generate your the baseline data for all the farmers we're working with so you'll get um you know your soil organic carbon percentage um but we also um combine that with your bulk density to give you a, a soil carbon stock level so um you know just i come from mclaren vale so at the moment just on our vineyard we're sitting in our top 30 centimeters at about one and a half percent carbon um and then when you when you multiply that with the bulk density of our of our soil, that gives us a soil carbon stock of about 50 tonnes a hectare at the moment. So um, we're going to be doing that a lot across the, the YP over the coming months uh, with our project. The way it's structured is that um, all of the sampling and lab testing is, is funded uh, through the project. Um, obviously, our project is very much focused on soil carbon quantification so the tests that we do typically are, or are just related to soil carbon and your soil carbon levels a number of producers have been asking if they can add other agronomic tests in at the same time so when we've actually you know got this soil coring rig out on your farm and they're punching cores it makes sense to get as much insights and, and knowledge as possible um, which we totally agree with and feels and we feel and we're recommending that's the direction that we we go going forward so we're not just doing soil carbon testing we're doing soil carbon testing plus actually doing some additional analysis that will help those producers understand what some of their constraints are to building soil carbon you know and as some of the previous presenters have been talking about whether that be ph or sadicity so um yeah that that feels like the direction that things will go and we've been assisting producers wherever that we can, they pick up um, the additional testing while we pick up all the costs of the soil carbon tests. A part of the project is that um, we have to share that government, that data back with the Australian government, because this data that we're gathering is helping basically to underpin innovation and research going forwards. So that's the kind of the deal will cover all the costs, but um, uh, the producer is happy to then share that data to help move this whole space forwards. And where we want to get to is um, getting to a point on somewhere like the YP where we have reached a critical mass of sampling across the whole of the peninsula so that um, as additional paddocks and farms get quantified, we're able to help those landholders see where they sit against the mean of soil carbon just in that particular geography. So you can, yeah, get an idea of, of where you sit. And then again, working with agronomists and farmers and researchers to understand if we can find the relationships about, you know, previous practices that farmers have adopted that might have a relationship with where they sit today. So, you know, in the mid north you know those first produce do we see can we actually pick up um a, a change in those livestock producers that maybe were some of the first to, to move to time control grazing can we actually see that they are typically on the 
on the upper levels of mean soil carbon for that area. So that's the kind of um, additional research questions that we want to um, want to answer through our project. Um, there are still a, just literally only a couple of spots left, uh, but if you do want to register for the project, please just go to getfarmlab.com forward slash carbon. Um, it takes about five minutes just to register and there's a few bits of information that we, we need and you'll see that we're looking to do A and B testing. So we're looking for you to help us with a, with an area of your farm where you believe that the carbon will be higher uh, and an area that you believe will be lower and, and somehow it links to uh, management practice that you've previously carried out. But, but please go through and register and yeah, Thank you again to, to Brad and the team at GPSA for their support of our project and helping to bring on so many producers. And obviously this is a, a step in the journey for a lot of you. The right first step is gonna be um, to profile your emissions in this whole space. So absolutely, you know, um, that's what we've done as, as grape growers ourselves, got our emissions known and then as, uh, and then you start to build onto that. Um, once you know your sources of emissions, we're helping to help fill that picture in about what are your stores of carbon. So obviously you'll have, you know, we've got stores in our, both our trees and our soils. So, you know, this is this is going to be a process that will go on for the next few years. The whole load of funding's just been released to the um, landscape boards around South Australia to help with carbon education over the next kind of couple of years. So I think, you know, if we don't have spots to be able to assist you now through this project, I think there's going to be more and more kind of extension support and funding coming through to help us all on this journey going forward. So thank you so much. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, now we've run out of time, so uh, we will take any questions uh, on notice and, and get back to you. Uh, we've reached the end of the webinar. Can you please uh, join me in thanking the presenters today? So we had Mike Lairs, Sean Mason, Brian Hughes and Ollie Madgett. I'd also like to thank the Northern and York Landscape Board for funding for the webinar through its grassroots grant program. On behalf of GPSA, I'd also like to thank you all for joining us. Uh, I hope it's been informative for you and you've managed to get some information out of this. Uh, wishing you all the best for a uh, festive season. Thanks again for joining us.